Hello, everyone, and um, I would like to welcome you uh, to our annual um, Environmental Society, International Environmental Society meeting. And um, it's a short two days program, but it's very diverse, and we try to cover many different um, topics in environmental statistics that are extremely relevant uh, to our today's state of affair, given climate change, climate sustainability, and resilience. And I hope that we will enjoy this program. And um, my first task for this uh, two days is uh, is very, uh, let's see, it's a great honor for me to introduce um, Rafael Huser, who is our Abdel El Sharavi Young Investigator Award winner for 2022. Uh, so, Rafael is professor in King Abdullah University of Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia. And um, I will just read a uh, 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 quotation why. The, the key ideas why Rafael has received this award and was very fierce competition this year. So in recognition of Rafael's fundamental contributions to the statistics of extremes, particularly the development of new sub-asymptotic models for special extremes and new statistical models for high impact and relevance in univariate, multivariate, spatial, and spatial temporal settings, in order to solve key methodological and applied problems, and to improve risk assessment of complex extreme events in a vast array of applications of which geo-environmental and climate applications are a major focus. Okay. So um, normally uh, we also provide plug. So Rafael, I hope that uh, you would visit TIES 2023 and so we'll give you this plug in person, but if not, then we'll send it to you, uh, to your home institution. Congratulations again. It's a, it's a great achievement, and I think it's a great honor for Thais and for Fel. So let's have like let's unmute yourself and make a lot of work. work. And uh without any further delays, so Rafael will deliver the first plenary talk in our meeting. Rafael. We'll share screens yeah, and yeah, yeah. Okay. yes, do you see my, yeah. see my yep. light? Yeah. Yes, it works. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I think I will not put them uh, full screen, otherwise I cannot see you <laughs> if if it's uh, working. Yeah, like sounds that. good. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's okay. okay. Thank you. All right. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, yes, first of all, I would like to thank a lot the organizers for um, inviting me to give this talk today, uh, for organizing this conference, and also for um, uh, the, the, the the committee of the Al Abdel El Sharwi Early Investigator Award for um, actually selecting me for this year, um, for, for being the recipient of this award this year. So thank you very much for that. So um, today I would like to actually give a talk that will essentially summarize some of my past research. Uh, some of it will not be very recent, actually, uh, but has been really instrumental in really shaping my research and, and some follow-up papers. And also to uh, discuss more some, some more recent advances that we've done. Uh, so I've entitled this talk, Modeling High Impact Environmental Extremes in Complex Settings recent progress and modern challenges. So this is the outline of the talk. I will first uh, give you a very brief overview of my past research, then uh, talk about classical extreme value theory, um, just to put everybody on the same page, uh, if you're not familiar with that. And then I will uh, start with uh, discussing a first paper, which I did already um, um, three years ago. Actually, it was published in 2019. And this is a joint work with uh, Jenny Watsworth from the University of Lancaster. Um, so that paper is entitled Modeling Spatial Processes with a Non-Extremal Dependence Class. Uh, 
Then I will uh, quickly discuss some modern challenges and how these can be addressed, or some of them can be addressed using machine learning techniques. And then in the second part, I will discuss a more recent contribution, which is now submitted but not uh, published yet with my postdoc Jordan Richards at KAUST, in which we actually propose uh, a new unifying framework based on partially interpretable neural networks, which we call the PIN framework for uh, high dimensional stream quantile regression. And then at the very end of the talk, I will just have one slide where I will discuss a few open questions and possible solutions for them. So um, my past research essentially has been really centered um, on, on, spatial, on uh, spatial statistics and statistics of extremes, as well as computational statistics, and has been mainly um, driven and fueled uh, with uh, a lot of different environmental applications including the modeling of wildfires, uh, heat waves, the high sea surface temperature, uh, mainly for the Red Sea, uh, also heavy precipitation, even in Saudi Arabia, where there is actually rain from time to time. Also the modeling of devastating landslides or air pollution and so on. So, um, so in all these applications, what I've tried to do is to develop sound and theoretically motivated extreme value models in order to not only model extremes, but also predict beyond extremes that have been observed in the past. Um, so here you can see a word cloud showing um, some of the, the keywords that appear in all the abstract of my publications. Um, and you can see really that what I've been really working on is really creating spatial models for extremes. This really appears very nicely on this, in this word cloud. So I, I've paid a lot of attention on, on dependence and how to build likelihood methods or inference methods that are very adapted and, and computationally efficient for fitting these uh, models to, to data. And I've done different applications, as I mentioned. One of them is landslides. This is like a big part of the work that I've done in the recent past, but I also looked at precipitation, temperature, and other type of data. So let me now give you a brief uh, overview of extreme value theory. And I will really start from the very beginning because I'm not sure if everybody is really familiar with that. So suppose that in the universe context, you are given a data set, Y1 up to Yn, and what you want to do is to actually say something about the probability of unprecedented extreme events. So, so this could be your, your data set. So they are represented here by these black points, and this could be the distribution that has, or the PDF that has actually generated this data, but of course you don't observe it in practice. And what you would like to do is to actually uh, say something about events that may actually be larger than the maximum in the data set. So uh, of course you can divide this distribution into the left tail, the bulk and the right tail. And here you can see a few extreme events that are highlighted in, in orange. So very low extremes in the left tail and very high extreme in the right tail, right? But the maximum is that point. And what you would like to do is to um, actually compute probabilities associated with events potentially even larger than this, right? So by unprecedented extreme events, I mean they could be unprecedented, unprecedentedly low ex extremes, so lower than the minimum in the data set, or they can be unprecedentedly high extremes, so larger than the maximum in the data set. Of course, if you haven't observed this data before, it doesn't mean that they cannot observe, right? It's just that they don't, they don't occur frequently, but they still have a positive probability to occur. So, um, so it's really interesting and important to actually try to build models to estimate these low tail probabilities. In the spatial context, things are more complicated because you not only have to care about marginal distributions, but you also have to care about the spatial dependent structure between the, the data. And so the question that might, uh, might arise in that context related to extremes is can you actually build and estimate spatial risk measures? So for example, high quantiles of a quantity of that type, where you can see that here, what you do is to compute the aggregated, uh, it's, a, it's a spatial aggregated quantity where you integrate over the spatial domain, this indicator function that the process exceeds a critical level U danger, potentially weighted with some other function, which could be po po population density, for example. So how can you compute this? How can you estimate these risk measures? And how can you do that um, efficiently and accurately whenever 
this threshold u is actually large, right? So of course, this measure depends both on marginal distributions and the spatial dependent structure of extremes. And so we need both in order to give accurate answers. So at the bottom here, I've just illustrated this uh, with um, a data set that we analyzed in a previous paper. So on the left panel here, you can see precipitation, uh, yearly precipitation maxima for 2012 uh, over the Eastern US. And you can really clearly see that there is indeed spatial dependence in this data, right? I mean, there is a spatial pattern. And so the question is, how can you build models and how can you estimate the spatial dependence structure of extremes in order to then deduce what could be um, the, the level for the, of extremes for the total precipitation within certain catchment illustrated here in the middle panel. Yeah, okay. And so that's where extreme value theory comes in. So extreme value theory is the science uh, about extrapolating into the joint upper tail. So it's a, it's a probability theory that um, is here to actually tell you or to build models in order to do this extrapolation into the tail based on resilient, reliable, and theoretical, theoretically justified methods. So the main idea of extreme value theory is to make some assumptions about the regularity of the tail in order that you can then use extreme events that are not too large in order to extrapolate to extreme events that are even larger, right? So we want to learn about ex unprecedented extreme events from less extreme events. So this is what extreme value theory is about. Um, so in the univariate context, there are essentially two different methods that can be used to do this. Uh, one is called the block maximum approach. And so again, suppose that you have a sequence of IID observations. So this could be, for example, precipitation, daily precipitation at a given site observed over like several years. And so the block maximum approach, what it would do is to, you would split the data set into different blocks. This could be yearly blocks, for example, or monthly blocks. And then for each block, you actually extract the maximum. So the, the yearly maximum, for example. So these are represented by these red points here. And so what then you would try to do is to find a distribution that approximates these maxima uh, accurately. And there is this extremal types theorem, which is essentially a central limit theorem, but for maxima that tells you that in the limit, as the block size n goes to infinity, a good approximation is found with the GV distribution. So the generalized extreme value distribution with some uh, location parameter, scale parameter, and shape parameter. And the shape parameter determines the type of distribution that you get in the limit. You can get the reverse Weibull distribution, the Gumbel distribution, or the Fraser distribution, which are represented here in this small graph. So that's the block maximum approach. The other approach that you can take is to is, the, is called the threshold exceedance approach. So here again, you have a sequence of IID random variables from some common distribution F. And what you do is to then define extreme events as uh, points that exceed a certain high level. So this high threshold here is taken to be this blue line. And then all the red points in that example would correspond to my extreme event, to threshold exceedances. And you have a similar result. Um, for threshold exceedances, which is the Pickens de Han Balkema theorem, which essentially says that for a broad range of distributions, as the threshold u goes to infinity, or in fact to the upper end point, then the distribution of these high threshold exceedances can be well approximated by this generalized Pareto distribution, GPD. And this has two parameters a scale parameter and a shape parameter, and the shape parameter is, has actually the same value as in the block ma maximum approach. So this GPD also can take different forms. You can have the uniform distribution, which is represented in, in blue here, the exponential or simply a parallel, which is heavy tail. There's also a third approach that I haven't really talked about, which is um, which actually unifies the block maximum approach and the threshold exceedance approach based on point processes. And I will talk about that a little bit more uh, in the second part of the presentation. So now when you have um, bivariate data, 
instead of just univariate data. It's more complicated because you also have to care about the dependence, right, between the vector components. So suppose that in this bivariate case, you have a random vector x and y, which have margins fx and fy. Um, the question that arises here is how can you characterize tail dependence, the dependence that hold in the tail? And to do this, there is a coefficient that is very well, uh, well known and, and widely used, which is this tail correlation coefficient chi, which is defined as a, a limiting conditional exceedance probability. So you look at the probability on the right here. So this is the probability that X is extreme in the sense that it exceeds a certain high quantile with probability U, given that Y is also similarly large. Okay. So given that Y is extreme, what is the probability that X is extreme? And then this coefficient chi is taken as the limit as this uniform quantile goes to go to one, right? And so you, then you can classify models into two different categories. Models that would be asymptotically tail dependent. So where you have a positive probability to have simultaneous extreme events in X and Y. This happens when chi is actually positive or models that are asymptotically tail independent, which we write TI, which happens whenever this chi is equal to zero. Now, this distinction is actually key for tail extrapolation because it will actually dictate what would be the probabilities of, of joint unprecedented extreme events, right? So it's very important to, to use models that, um, that will capture this tail dependence class correctly. Now, in the asymptotic tail independent case, of course, this chi, this limiting chi is not extremely helpful because it's just zero. So it doesn't really tell you much about the strength of tail dependence uh, among extremes, right? Because it's just the value zero. So in that case, what we usually do is to consider this other coefficient, which is called the coefficient of tail dependence, which is uh, indicated by this letter, this Greek letter eta which gives a refined description of the strength of tail dependence in the independence case, tail independence case. And what ETA does essentially is to characterize the joint tail decay rate. So how fast does this coefficient KU go to zero, right? You see the ETA appears here in the exponent. So this pair of coefficients of chi and ETA are usually used to um, describe and characterize uh, models in terms of their tail dependence. And so here I show you two different examples. In the first plot, you have uh, this coefficient chi of u, um, the theoretical chi for multivariate Gaussian distribution with a specif specific uh, correlation, which is less than one. And you can see that, in fact, this function chi go to zero, whatever this correlation is, right? So here I took three different values of this correlation from low correlation to strong correlation, but whatever is this correlation, this chi of u coefficient will always go to zero. So we are in the asymptotic independence case here. On the right-hand side, you have the same thing, but for multivariate t distribution, where I just varied the degrees of freedom in this multivariate t vector. And you can see here that the limit is actually positive. So we are in the asymptotic dependence case. Um, and the, the the level of this limit actually depends on these degrees of freedom, right? But the point is that the multivariate Gaussian is always asymptotically independent and the multivariate T is always asymptotically dependent. They cannot capture both scenarios within the same framework, within the same model. So this is a bit limiting and, and problematic for, for in, in practice. So as I mentioned before, this has implication for risk assessment because it will actually dictate how you extrapolate further into the tape. So now in the spatial extremes um, context, what are the models that have been used a lot in the past? Um, so there are essentially also two different approaches, one based on block maxima, where you actually consider now the pointwise maximum of spatial processes, so at each side. And in that context, in fact, you can show that the only possible limits of, for this type of, of processes are so-called max stable processes. These are the only possible non-degenerate limits that arise for spatial maxima. And they, they, have, they are characterized by a, a property known as max stability, which I will not uh, discuss in detail here. 
And the second approach is to use threshold exceedances, but now you need to actually define what you mean by a spatial process being extreme. So there are different notions that lead to different types of limits. And, but this class of R parallel processes, essentially uh, you can show that they arise as the only possible non-degenerate limits for R exceedances where extremes are defined in terms of a suitable risk functional R. Right, so for example, R could be the maximum of the process over the domain, or could be the minimum, or could be the integral over the domain, or subdomain. And then you would actually say that the process Y is extreme whenever this risk functional applied to Y exceeds the high threshold. Right, and so in that context, you can show that these R Pareto processes are the only possible limits for these spatial, um, spatial exceedances. Okay, and they are also characterized by a specific property known as threshold stability. So while uh, maxable processes are max stable, Pareto processes are threshold stable. And I, you, will, you will understand what this means uh, in just one or two slides. So now the question is um, whether these asymptotic models are any good. Right. I mean, it's always good to have asymptotic models and asymptotic theory because it can actually guide model construction and it can provide models that might actually be helpful in practice. Now, the question is whether you actually see max stability in the data and whether you see threshold stability in the data. So do these models really fit well? Do the data support max stability and threshold stability? So I want to quote this um, uh, I mean, John Tukey, who said, the purpose of asymptotic theory in, in statistics is simple, to provide usable approximations before passage to the limit. So, um, so this is just to say that whenever we have asymptotic theory, we need to think really carefully if this asymptotic theory actually um, works with the data that we have. So do we see max stability in real data? So um, to answer this question, we have actually looked at wind gust data from the Netherlands. And you can see here a graph um, of what we call the level dependent extremal coefficient, which I will not describe. But this was computed for at, two, at three different uh, scales. So the daily scale, so daily maxima, weekly maxima, and monthly maxima. And so if the process was actually max stable, then all these curves should coincide and they should all be constant as a function of this quantile level Z that is on the X axis. And here you can very clearly see that these curves are not the same and they are not constant, but rather tend to increase. So this in indicates that data are not max stable. They do not actually support max stability in that case, but instead, instead of it max stable, they tend to support the idea that the dependent structure is weakening as extreme events become more extreme. Um, we can also ask ourselves, well, are the data threshold stable? And so to see that, we have actually looked at a different data set. So here, uh, precipitation data from the US for two different pairs of sites. You can see at short distances and high dis distances. And so this, in this plot, I show this coefficient chi u uh, that I mentioned before. And so if the data were threshold stable, then essentially this curve should stabilize above a certain level. It should be constant again as a function of u above a certain level. But here you can again clearly see that this curve seems to be de decreasing and never stabilizing, which indicates that the data are not threshold stable. And so this means that these asymptotic models have really limitations in practice. Um, and they might actually not be good fits for, for the data. For most environmental data sets that I've been analyzing, uh, I haven't seen threshold stability and max stability very often. They also have uh, other limitations relate, uh, related to uh, their tail structure and the fact that they are also very computationally demanding to fit. So for example, maxable processes are typically limited to dimensions 10 or 12 unless you use less efficient techniques like composite likelihoods and Pareto processes are typically limited to dimensions 30 to 50. And so these issues like the lack of flexibility of these asymptotic models uh, 
and the computational intractability of these asymptotic models have essentially driven my research. And so what I've tried to do in the past is to really develop uh, theoretically motivated sub-asymptotic models that provide better fits at levels that are not yet in the limit and that models that can be fitted more, um, more efficiently using methods that are computationally feasible and scalable. Okay, so uh, with that in mind, with this background, um, I will I would like to now discuss the first um, the first paper that I mentioned, which is this joint work with uh, Jennifer Wattsworth from the University of Lancaster, uh, in which we actually propose spatial processes that can account for a non extremal dependence class, right? So can bridge asymptotic tail dependence and independence within the same framework. So this was published in JAZA in 2019, and this is the reference if you're interested to have a closer look at that paper. So the motivating, motivating example that we had in mind here was uh, significant wave heights from the North Sea. So, um, so as you might know, there are actually oil fields in the, in the North Sea. So here we can see a map of some of the oil fields from, from the UK. And um, for the safety of these oil platforms, it's really important to, to predict how high the, the, wave, the waves actually might be, right? So here you can see pictures of these um, oil platforms. And so, um, and so it's really important and crucial for uh, the safety of these platforms to, to, to predict the probabilities of extreme events or spatial extreme events related to wave height. And so um, what we did here, um, at the start is to actually compute this coefficient KU, this conditional um, threshold exceedance probability for 50 sites where we had the data. And so we actually, this KU is, uh, is a coefficient in, for two variables, but you can extend it to more than two variables. And here we computed it for 50 sites. And we did this um, using an empirical approach and we use a bootstrap method also to compute the, the variability uh, of these estimated coefficients. And then we plotted these empirical coefficients as a function of the threshold U, right? So U is the empirical threshold. So it indicates the level of extremeness of the spatial extreme event. And what you can see is that this coefficient actually decreases rather than being stable. So this indicates that the Pareto process would not be suitable here. It seems that the dependence um, strength in this data is actually weakening as events become more extreme rather than stabilizing. But the limit is not very clear, right? I mean, we don't really know if the limit is zero, which would be asymptotic independence, or whether it's positive, which would be asymptotic dependence. And so we wanted to have a model that can capture both and that, that can be helpful for us to maybe even test for the asymptotic dependence class. So how did we build that model. Um, so the, the construction is fairly simple. It's here at the bottom, right? So you see there is R, W, and there's this coefficient delta. So what is W? W is a stationary spatial process with standard Pareto margins and asymptotic independence. So in other words, this means that the marginals, um, marginal probabilities are driven by this first equation here. So this is just the condition that it has to be Pareto. And the joint tail probabilities are given by this expression here, right? So, um, so you see this eta here is the coefficient of tail dependence of this process W, and it really indicates how fast this joint tail probability will actually go to zero. Now, what is R? R is simply a random variable that has the Pareto uh, distribution, the unit Pareto distribution, right? So it's it's not a spatial process, it's just a single uh, random variable. And then we somehow mix R and W in this way with this parameter delta, okay? So delta will control how much weight we put on R and how much weight we put on W. So the model is this, and then we will actually not fit the model in the original scale of, the, of, of X, but we will actually fit the copula. So what we will do is to extract the copula structure from that spatial process that we will then fit to the data. So why is that construction uh, good? Well, intuitively, when delta is bigger than one half, then this r to the power delta will dominate in the tail. 
So R to the power delta will be heavier tailed than W to the power one minus delta. And this will induce asymptotic tail dependence because R is spatially constant, right? It doesn't, it's not a spatial process. So you can think of it as a spatially constant random field. On the other hand, if delta is less than one half, then R to the power delta will be lighter tailed than W to the power one minus delta. And this will induce asymptotic tail independence. And you can actually show that you can formalize this. So I will uh, skip this slide here. You have a, we have a theorem that actually tells us that this is indeed true, right? So if delta is bigger than one half, we have asymptotic dependence. We can in fact compute this coefficient chi is given in this expression here, and it depends on the w that you specify. But if delta is less than one half, we have, we have asymptotic independence, so chi is equal to zero, and we can actually compute this coefficient of tail dependence um, explicitly. And this depends not only on delta but also on the coefficient of tail dependence of the W process. Right. Now, what should you take for W? Because uh, in the construction, we just said that W had to have Pareto margins and asymptotic independence. So there are different possibilities. One possibility is to actually take simply a Gaussian copula that you rescale, so with uniform margins, that then you rescale to have uh, standard Pareto margins. So the formula would be this. Or what you could do is to consider an inverted maxable copula instead, which is also, um, also asymptotically independent. But the point is that you have many different types of possibilities, and this gives the, uh, this means that the framework is quite flexible, quite general. Um, so in this graph here, you can see what uh, this KU coefficient looks like for that model. Um, so as a function of the threshold u at, on the x-axis and as a function of the delta parameter, which corresponds here uh, to the different lines. So you see that when delta is big, 0 0.9, essentially you have almost a flat line and you have a positive limit. When delta is 0.6, for example, it goes down a little bit, but then it actually reaches a positive limit again. On the other hand, when delta is less than one half, let's say it's 0 0.45, then it decreases and then reaches zero in the limit. And so you can see that really this model, although it's very parsimonious, can bridge asymptotic tail dependence and independence with the transition between the two classes happening exactly in the middle, in the interior of the parameter space, which is very nice. So uh, coming back to the model, essentially you can think of that model as interpolating between the spatial structure of W, so asymptotic independence, all the way to the spatial structure of R, which is full dependence, right? So we can capture all different types of dependence in between. How do we make inference? Well, we do this in two steps. So as I mentioned, we want to fit the copula associated with this model, uh, model X. So for that, we need first to transform the margins to the uniform scale, which we can do it using non-parametric techniques, for example. So if you have replicates at every site, what you can do is to use the empirical CDF and then uh, transform the data using this empirical CDF. This would just be a rank transform. And then you obtain pseudo, uh, uniform, scale, um, pseudo uniform scores that you can then use as your data to fit the copula. And then in the second step, you actually fit the copula model. Now, how do we fit this copula model? Well, we want to fit the model to the tail, to the joint tail. So we will need to censor the observations that are not extreme, right? All the observations that are not in the tail, we don't want them to influence the fit of the extremal dependent structure. And so we will have to censor these low observations in order to prevent any bias. So how does this, um, this work? So the censored log likelihood will actually look like this. And these censored likelihood contributions, Li, will have three different forms. So if my vector of observations has components that are all large, they are all extreme simultaneously at the different sites, then we will use the copula PDF, the PDF itself. If the components are all very low, so below certain thresholds, we will use the copula CDF, 
instead, evaluated at these thresholds. And in between, if we have a few components that are large, a few that are small, then we will have to compute these partial derivatives of the copula uh, CDF with respect to the elements that are large. So just to illustrate this concept in two dimensions, um, you can just look at this graph here. So suppose that you have data only at two sites. So you have U1 and U2. And here you have set high thresholds with respect to the first component and the second component. So if you have a data points that lie in this uh, upper quadrant, uh, upper uh, right corner here, then essentially this vector is large with respect to both components. And so we will actually use the actual value of the point of both points. Now, if my point lies in this area here, so all the components of my vector are small, lower than the threshold that I, that I fixed, then I don't want to use the information about the data themselves because this will bias the estimation of the XML dependent structure. And so the likely contribution in that case would just be the probability to lie in that rectangle, which is the copula CDF. And now if my point lies here, so it's partially extreme, so extreme with respect to the first component, but not with respect to the second, what we will have to do is to integrate with respect to the second component. And this is the same as, in fact, calculating derivatives of the copula CDF. So this is just in dimension two, but you can extend that idea in, in dimension D. Now, for uh, using this approach, we need the copula CDF, we need the copula PDF, and we need the partial derivatives. So uh, for our model, they actually look like this. So this is a bit uh, complicated. And in fact, they involve um, univariate integral that we cannot compute analytically. So um, we have to compute these integrals uh, numerically, but this is not too bad because this is just a one dimensional integral. So we can use numerical techniques, routines to do this. Now, of course, this will slow down the, the estimation. That's one disadvantage of this model, but it can still be done. Okay, so we have done a small simulation study to test this approach, the sensor likelihood approach uh, for our model. And so what we've done here is to simulate data in dimension two, five, 10, and 15, right in red, uh, red, green, blue, and light blue for different values of the delta parameters. So from 0 0.1, which is asymptotic independence to 0 0.9, which is asymptotic dependence. Um, we have taken for W a Gaussian copula that we have rescaled to the Pareto scale. And so the correlation function was just taken to be this powered exponential correlation with some range parameter, a lambda and new, a smoothness parameter new. So in total, the model has three parameters, range, smoothness, and this delta parameter. So it's a very parsimonious model and still it can capture asymptotic dependence and independence within the same model. So that's quite nice. Uh, we have set the thresholds to the 95th percentile. So we have in fact about 50 exceedances at each location. And so from this graph, you can essentially see that this uh, sensor likelihood approach works. Uh, although the variability can be quite high when delta is actually fairly small or when the dimensionality is not too big. You can also use this model to test for the asymptotic dependence class, as I mentioned. So because, and this is facilitated because the transition between dependence cl classes, so tail dependence classes takes place in the interior of the parameter space. So you can test for asymptotic dependence, so which corresponds to delta being bigger than one half, versus asymptotic independence when delta is less than one half, or you can test for the opposite, right? And here in these graphs, I've shown you essentially the power function. So the probability of, of null hypothesis being rejected uh, based on these two different uh, scenarios, two different hypotheses, and three different dimensions, two, five, and 10. And you can see that this is essentially working quite nicely, right? You see this transition here, is taking place at delta equal to one half, which is really where the transition happens. Okay, so now I want to discuss uh, briefly the application that we did. Um, so we looked at significant wave heights from the North Sea. We had about 28 uh, hundreds daily observations at 50 locations. And what we did was to take 20 sites for fitting and actually the rest of the sites, actually all the sites, 
for validation. And we, um, we fitted two different models. So our model, but also a Gauss and Coppola model, which is a special case, right? And what you can see is that for the 20 sites that we use for fitting or the 30 other sites that we left out, essentially the fit of our model is very good. This is in blue. It fits very well, these empirical points, while the Gauss and Coppola model tends to underestimate the strength of dependence a little bit. Uh, interestingly, this delta parameter is estimated to be 0 0.46, so this indicates symptotic tail independent, which corroborates what, what was found before by Wadsworth and Tone. But the confidence interval includes one half. You might say, well, this is not so nice because you cannot really make firm conclusions about the dependence class, but we think this is actually a good thing because it means that the, the model itself is able to account for the uncertainty about uh, the limit, which is, um, so it's always uncertain what the limit is and the model is, is the first one that is able to really properly account for that uncertainty. All right, so for the sake of time, I will uh, skip the summary here, but you can actually find all the details in that paper if you're interested. Let me now very briefly talk about uh, modern challenges with respect to what I just discussed. Um, so the application that we that I presented was done on 50 sites and we actually use only 20 sites for fitting. Now in modern applications with the rise of you know climate uh, model outputs in very high resolutions or um, a remote sensing data and so on, it's very common to have data sets that are much bigger than this, right? That reach dimensions of the size 100 or 1,000 or even like 10,000 or even more, right? Um, and the problem is that most spatial or spatial temporal extremes models are really difficult to apply in high dimensions. So they are computationally intractable. And this is due mainly to the likelihood function itself being used. For maximal processes, as I mentioned before, this likelihood is intractable for dimension bigger than 12. For Pareto processes, which require multivariate censoring, this is also limited to about dimension 50, if you use a full likelihood. And this is the same for the sub-asymptotic models like the one I just presented, right? So that's one of the key issues. Another um, issue is that these, despite these recent, recent advances, most spatial extremes models are still often relatively rigid in their dependent structure. So for example, in the model I presented, you can have this transition between model classes, but you cannot have different types of asymptotic tail dependencies for different pairs of sites. And in practice, you would actually, it would be more natural to assume asymptotic dependence at short distances and asymptotic independence as the distance between sites increases to infinity. Another uh, major uh, problem is that often the data are non-stationary or anisotropic. And this is even more a problem when the data dimensionality increases, right? As, as you get more and more data, as the data become bigger and bigger, then this means that also the models that are needed to model this data should also be more and more complex, right? So we should be able to account for non-stationarity in margins and dependence, potentially in space and time uh, as well, right? And so now I strongly believe that machine learning methods have really a key role to play here. While not forgetting about statistics, of course, I, I believe that uh, these machine learning approaches when they are appropriately combined with extreme value theory uh, can actually address several of these challenges um, related to the modeling of extreme events. So um, I want now to switch to the second part where I will actually illustrate one recent application that we've done that uses machine learning to address one of these questions. So how can we estimate the marginal distribution of extremes in a very non-stationary framework and perform extreme quantile regression, right? While keeping the interpretability of that we like with classical quantile regression approaches in statistics. So the paper is here, it's uh, on archive, so you can check the reference if you're interested but it's not uh, published yet. So the motivation here came from the modeling of wildfires, which caused significant death and damage across the world. And especially recent years have seen really devastating wildfires in the, in the Western US with really hundreds of deaths or 
millions of acres of destroyed lands. And in 2021 alone, um, global wildfires contributed to about a bit less than two gigatons of carbon emissions. So there's a vicious cycle here, uh, a vicious uh, feedback loop where wildfires uh, both aggravate climate change, but also are aggravated by climate change. And so to mitigate this risk, we need to identify the drivers of extreme wildfires and high risk areas. And one way to do this is to actually measure high quantiles of burnt area uh, for over, over space and time. So this is where this idea of doing extreme quantile regression comes from. So what we want to do here in this work is to perform quantile regression where the response is taken to be the aggregated burnt area for a spatial temporal grid box and where we are actually interested really in the upper tail. So we want to, to estimate very high quantiles where the most dangerous wildfires actually occur. And these typical quantiles of interest will be larger than previously observed. And so this means that you cannot really use these classical non-parametric quantile regression methods, which will perform very poorly. So instead, what we do is to turn to parametric quantile regression using some of the asymptotically justified extreme value models that I presented before. So you could use the GV distribution for maxima or the GPD for threshold exceedances, or this third approach that I mentioned, which is the point process approach, we will, which we will actually use if that work. So here at the bottom, you can see uh, the data that we have. So it's essentially um, burned area for different for grid boxes over space and time uh, for the US, and that's monthly data. So on the left, you can see the logarithm of burnt area for July 2007, which was quite extreme in the Western US. And on the right, you can see burnt area for July 2012. So what we want is to use this data and to then predict very high quantiles at each spatial lo location and, temp and, and time point. So, of course, parametric quantile regression is not new. Even parametric extreme quantile regression is not new. And what people usually do is to assume a certain um, distribution for the response, which might depend on some parameters, theta. So it could be a vector. And this, they um, represent theta as a function of a certain number of predictors x, which lie in Rd. So in our case, D is actually equal to 30. So we are in a fairly high dimensional case where we have a lot of uh, predictors that affect the response through, through the response distribution parameters. And so the goal is to find a relationship between X and theta. So typical approaches, what they have done is to use either linear models, but of course, as you can imagine, linear models um, are not flexible enough, enough to capture nonlinear structures, so they perform very poorly for complex problems. Or people have also used uh, additive models, so representing the relationship between theta and x using splines, for example, so semi-parametric models. Uh, but these additive models also scale pre pretty poorly to high dimensions, right? So here, remember that we have 30 predictors, which is, in fact, quite high. So instead, what we do here is to turn to deep learning methods based on artificial neural networks, because these neural networks are known to be able to capture complex structures in, in data, including nonlinearity and interactions between the predictors. They scale well to high dimensions, and they facilitate high predictive accuracies thanks to these uh, approximation, um, um, general appro approximation theorems of neural networks. Now, statisticians usually don't really like neural networks so much because they are a black box. So uh, what we do instead is to, per to construct a framework which is partially interpretable, and we call it the PIN framework. So again, we assume a certain response distri distribution that depends on some parameters, which themselves depend on x. And then what we will do is to split the predictor set x into a part that will be interpreted, xi, and a part that will be not interpreted or non-interpretable xn. And then we represent each parameters in this way. So through a link function, and then you have an intercept, you have a function of the interpretable predictors plus another function of the non-interpretable predictors. Now this, for the interpretable part, we will assume that this function is either linear or additive so that you can really make sense of the results. 
And for the non-interpretable part, we don't really care about interpreting the effects of these, these predictors. We just want to use them for boosting the model's predictive accuracy. And so what we will actually do is to take a neural network for this function, mn. And so all of these uh, models can be estimated, or all of these functions can be estimated simultaneously by minimizing a loss function here that we take to be a penalized log likelihood. And we exploit uh, stochastic gradient descent uh, using uh, Keras, the interface to Keras in R. So um, as I mentioned, we use the point process approach. So how does this work? So if you assume that the uh, theorem for maxima converging to the GV distribution holds. You can also show that by considering this point process, where it's a, a point process that contains the rescale times of events, as well as the rescale observations themselves, this point process converges in distribution to a Poisson point process for any, um, any regions of this form where the mean measure of that Poisson process has that, has that form. And so uh, essentially this means that extreme events, because when, when n is increases to infinity, in fact, these points will actually converge to the lower end point. And so when you fix a, th a threshold u here, all the points that will exceed u will be extreme events. So all the extreme events exceeding a threshold u, a high threshold u, will be essentially described by Poisson point process within this mean measure here. And what you can see is that in this mean measure, there is this G that appears, which is nothing but the GV distribution, right? And so from that result, you can actually um, construct a point process likelihood, which, uh, which is written here. And you can see that it depends, of course, on the parameters, mu, sigma, and psi, which themselves, in fact, depend on the predictors. And um, as I actually, I didn't mention it before, but the, the GV distribution when Xi is um, positive has a lower endpoint. And so uh, this lower endpoint can cause a problem. This is a major issue for training neural networks because as the algorithm proceeds, when you propose new values, you might actually jump outside of the parameter space and the algorithm will actually fail. So instead, of using exactly this point process likelihood, what we do is to design a new point process that is very close to the point process I just presented, but that really modifies the lower tail so that we don't have the lower, lower bound problem. This is done through the blended GV distribution, which I don't really have time to explain here in detail. So that's the paper for that blended GV distribution if, in case you're, you're interested in this. Um, and I will skip this slide. So let me now describe the application. So here, what we did is to model monthly burned area data for the whole contiguous US. Um, the, we had data for all months from 1993 to 2015, from March to September. So this gave us uh, 161 total fields. Each field had uh, about 3,500 locations. So that's quite a big data set. And we then modeled the extremes of burnt area in terms of uh, about 30 predictors. <clears throat> so we had land cover maps from Copernicus with proportion of grid cells consisting of one of 18, 18 different types lo like water, urban areas, grasslands. So you can see actually the proportion of grass, grasslands on the right hand side here in this map. We also had 10 meteorological variables from the ERA-5 reanalysis of, uh, on land surface including temperatures, which is represented here, wind speed components, precipitation, and so on. And we also had um, the mean and the standard deviation of altitude from NASA. So in total, 30 predictors, and we used our framework to estimate quantize. So what we did was to actually build two different models, one for the occurrence of wildfires. So whether there is or there is no wildfire in a specific grid cell, so that's essentially a binary situation. And for that, we use logistic regression. And the other case is, the other model is to model the spread of wildfires using actually the model, the point process model that we proposed before. 
for the spread, we actually modeled the, the square root of strictly positive burnt area. Um, so given that it's positive, and why do we take the, the square root? Because for two reasons, one reason is that we actually found out that the, the distribution was very heavy tailed. So this made it uh, a bit uh, less stable. So by taking the square root, you make it less heavy tailed. And the other reason is that burnt area is an area, right? So by taking the square root, you make it on the same scale as the diameter of the burnt area, which also is something that you can interpret. So um, we chose to interpret seven predictors, which were nor east and north wind speed components, temperature, precipitation, Rafael, sorry, you're muted. Oh, sorry. I'm not sure yeah, how this happened. Thank you. Okay, maybe this was the connection. So uh, it was just on this slide, right? Yeah. Okay, so uh, let me just repeat what I just said. So we chose to interpret seven predictors, which are given here. And all the other 23 predictors actually fed the neural network. So they were only used to boost the model's predictive accuracy. So uh, we estimated the shape parameter to be this value here, which is really indeed quite heavy tech. Uh, before I talk about some of the results, so here I, I can show you uh, a comparison between different model types. So where we actually model, um, we didn't, so in this first one, fully linear, we didn't use any additive models or any neural networks. We just assumed everything to be linear. In this um, fully GAM, we used a model that was fully additive without linear parts and without neural networks. And fully NN means uh, only using the neural network uh, part. And the model we propose is the one at the bottom, right? Where part of the predictors are linear, part are additive using this GAM formulation, and part are modeled uh, through this neural network. What we find essentially is that the fully neural network model is the best, but it's not really interpretable. And the second best is the model we propose here, right? So you have the predictive power of neural networks, which really boosts the model predictive accuracy. But at the same time, you can interpret the, the effects of the coverage that you chose to interpret. The second comparison here is that you can then further enhance the, the performance of the neural network if you choose a neural network with layers that are well adapted to the adapted to the problem at hand. So here we compared uh, densely connected neural networks with two, three, four, and six layers, as well as, as convolutional neural networks, so CNNs with two, three, four, and six layers. And we found that the CNNs worked much better. And so we, and that's because the CNNs actually appropriately capture the spatial structure in the data. So what we found is that, um, so here, these are the effects of the linear, the, the, the coefficients, sorry, the predictors that were modeled linearly in the location parameter. And we found that temperature had the positive and significant effect, evaporation as well, which also makes sense. But precipitation had no effect and the proportion of urban coverage was also not significant. Also wind speed, surprisingly, only had a negligible effect at this temporal scale. And here are some of the predictors that we model using splines, so additively. And you can see that again, I mean, the, my point in this graph is that you can really make sense of the results. You can start to interpret and have really um, nice interpretations, right? Uh, if you were only using your networks, you wouldn't be able to interpret the results um, in, in this way. And then finally, what we do is to combine these two models together, the model for the occurrence of wildfires together with the uh, model for the spread of wildfires in order to create maps of compound risk where we here show uh, extreme quantiles, unconditional quantiles. And you can use that to assess the risk and identify high risk areas. So in summary, in this work, what we did was to propose a very flexible framework for fitting extreme value models using deep learning. We, this framework combines the high predictive accuracy of neural networks 
with the interpretability of linear and additive models. The models actually fit very well the wildfire data and reveal new insights into the drivers of extreme wildfires. And we also had some uh, follow-up work on uh, wildfires in Europe. Uh, the paper is here, and you can also ask Jordan uh, if you're interested to test his R package that is called PIN EV. So with that, I just want to finish with one slide on possible um, open questions and, and solutions to that. So I just identified three questions that just came to mind. So one is, how is it possible to perform really truly fast and optimal inference for general intractable models that may, ha may have very intractable likelihood functions like the one I presented, or that need to do sens censoring in, in high dimensions. I mean, if you're able to address this question, then I think you can really have an impact in, in spatial, um, in, in statistical extremes. The second question is how to model highly complex dependent structures in spatial extremes. Um, which is also very important because usually people only use very simple models or um, maybe models that are stationary and isotropic, but we know that in real data, this is not the case. The last question is how to enforce sparse extremal dependent structures um, in, in spatial extremes. And so the benefit of sparsity is that you, it can be used for um, both making fast computations as well as having models that can be easily interpreted. And so uh, to answer the first question, actually, we, I think we addressed that question in a recent paper where we propose neural base estimators that are again based on machine learning, where th these are neural networks that are permutation invariant and we show that they are actually optimal uh, for dealing with independent replicates. So you can check that paper, but there's a lot to be done in that context. And so I'm really excited about this new uh, direction that I want to explore. For the second one, I think we could ex extend a deep composition, compositional deformation approach that was proposed by Andrew Zamit Monjon in the cl classical Gaussian context to here the spatial extremes context. And I have a student working on that now. And the last one would be to develop SPD type models for spatial extremes. And so currently this is not exactly clear how to do this, but I think if you can do this, this would really uh, make a huge difference in spatial extremes. So with that, I stop here and I welcome any questions. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Rafael. So let's firstly uh, thank Rafael for a great talk. And we have a few, like a couple of minutes for questions. So if you have a question, please uh, uh, put it in chat. Okay, or uh, raise your hand if you have a question. But um, Rafael, if you can stay a little bit uh, longer and answer questions, if any. So I actually have a question. Um, so, I mean, it's absolutely fascinating talk. Oh, there is a question actually. What is the criteria from Amira? What is the criteria to decide these variables to go um, to the interpretable, non-interpretable part of the model? Yeah, thank you very much. So that's a very good question. I think this is really uh, problem dependent. So, so here um, in this uh, work, we, try, we decided to interpret these seven predictors because we thought these were really key to actually, um, to have a key effect on, on wildfires, right? On the occurrence and the spread of extreme wildfires, um, especially temperature, right? And evaporation. We thought also that precipitation might have an effect, but we did, we actually found that it was not really the case. So I think this is really dependent on the question you want to address, the, the scientific question you want to address. And uh, we don't have any like objective criterion. This is really with respect to what you are interested to address. Thank you. And uh, my question was, I mean, we can, we can talk later on this, but there's a, Appearing papers, for example, deep Archimedean formula uh, in machine learning, where people try to use uh, deep learning models to find parameters for generator function for a popula. And I think that that kind of fits in very well with what you're doing here. So are you, I mean, what do you think about this line of work in ML? Uh, 
So you mean to generate copula models using deep learning? That's what you said? Exactly. Yep. Um, it, it, I mean, you, I mean, for example, using GANs, I mean, this generative. At, um, yeah, it can be any, yeah, it can be GAN, but it, it doesn't. Right. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of different techniques from machine learning that can be borrowed and used and extended to actually spatial statistics or statistical extremes. So uh, what I presented here in the second part is just one possibility to use deep learning in order to enhance the predictability of, um, of the models that we typically use in spatial stat and, and extremes, but there are a lot of different options, right? So I mentioned also at the end this, um, this work that I've, uh, this recent work that I've done with uh, Andrew Zamit Mangion and his student, uh, Matt, uh, Matthew Sainsbury Dale. So, there, what we did was really to develop um, new neural networks. So, based on the deep sets framework, essentially to estimate parameters in models that are intractable. And so, this is another application where you can actually use deep learning to. Um, to make very efficient inference for statistical problems, right? But of course, this is not limited to this, and there, there are really a lot of avenues for future research in this in this area. Yeah, thank you very much. And for the sake of it's it's absolutely great talk, and I would appreciate because there are more questions in the chat. So if you can stay and answer some of the questions, and thanks very much again. And for the sake of time, so what we are on a, a long hour schedule. So um, the next session um, is environmental exposure modeling between challenges and advances. And organizer and chair is Monica Pirani from Imperial College. And she is also co-organizer of this conference. Thank you. And Monica, the floor is yours.